You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Matt Migaki, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing killer craft beers. If you've ever wanted to sneak backstage and share a beer with one of your favorite musicians, well, Vox and Hops is the podcast for you. This week on the podcast, I dropped a killer episode with Kelly Schaefer of Atheist. There is this episode and over 440 other ones to help you enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. So what are you waiting for? It's time to become a Vox and Hops head. Cheers. What is up, everybody? Welcome to today's podcast. Again, I thank you for choosing to spend your time with me today. I super appreciate that. We've got a fair bit of stuff to get to before we dive right into this episode. So let's get right to it. First of all, Gear Fest. I am headed to Sweetwater this week for Gear Fest, and I will be making a ton of content. There will be a ton of bonus interviews that come out when I get back. There's going to be lots of stuff on socials. There's going to be just a ton of stuff. I'm going to make as much as I possibly can in the time that I have. There's a bunch of YouTubers going as well, so there should be a lot of content from some of your favorite channels. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be a wild time. And, you know, I'm told they have some really special stuff planned for us, so hopefully I can grab as much for you guys as possible. I'm going to be posted up in one of the recording studios with my very own podcast station to bring people back for chats and interviews, and we'll just fly by the seat of our pants and see what happens. So please stay tuned to all of the Tone Mob stuff for a bunch of stuff that's coming out here after Gear Fest. So thank you to Sweetwater for having me out for that, and I hope you all enjoy all the extra content that that's going to generate. Second of all, to go along with this episode, I did something a little bit different. I made a song using only the Maris LVX. If you clicked on this, you know that I'm talking to the Maris folks, and the conversation is heavily around the LVX pedal that they just came out with, which is a completely new platform that is going to really really be important moving forward, and they did a fantastic job with this thing. We get into the weeds a little bit with the development process and what they were trying to achieve, but more importantly, I was able to take just this pedal, one guitar, and my laptop when I went to Nashville here a few weeks ago, and in the night times after I got done working, I worked on a song, and a new American Cyclops song was born out of just those three tools. It's pretty weird. It's pretty, uh, I've been told it sounds like a horror video game soundtrack, but I was really stoked with how it came out and it is available now streaming on wherever you stream music at. It's called 2AM because that's when I recorded it and those are the vibes it has. So if you want to check that out, the link to Spotify and Apple Music will be in the show notes and you can obviously grab it wherever you stream stuff. It is officially out today. So it's called 2AM and it's on the American Cyclops streaming places. So check that out if you could. That would really help me out and I would appreciate it very much. But that is a lot of blabbering for the top of the show. Let's get into this one with Terry and Angelo from Maris. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Tone Mob Podcast, the show about guitar stuff occasionally, sometimes. I'm your host, Blake Weiland, and with me today, I have returning Terry and Angelo from Maris. What's going on, fellas? Hey there. Hey. Hi. This Happy is, to uh, be here. This is, uh, this is cool. You know, I, uh, you guys have been hard at something for a long time. It came out and seemingly blew the doors off, and uh, the main question I get from people who have seen it is like, yeah, but what is it? <laughs> so what better t- uh, what better place and what better people to have explained that to everyone? Uh, that In fact, I put some questions in the Facebook group, and that was the main thing. Like, I don't even know what it is. It just looks awesome. And after spending some time with it, with LVX, uh, 
you know, you you guys have labeled it as a modular delay, and I don't know what else you would label it as, but it that I think sells it kind of short because there's so it's so deep. So maybe you can talk about where the concept came from, and maybe in your own words, explain what what this tool really is. Well, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for having us on, Blake. First, totally. Um, I listen to the show all the time. <laughs> Thank you very Honestly, much. Honestly, I do. And uh, I think the last one I listened to was the Science Amps episode. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was cool and interesting. That was a fun um, one. Yeah, LVX, I'm not entirely uh, dissatisfied with that reaction because I hope that it keeps people um, kind of discovering what it is along the way. Mm -hmm. We call it a modular delay system just because it... Uh, encompasses kind of the big box ethos of delays that came before it, like um, the DL4 and lineage like that, mm -hmm. but just throws out the window everything about the um, the preset kind of, you know, rotary dial, dial up your preset delay sounds. Right. And in, fa in, in favor of making everything modular so you can have full freedom, full flexibility on everything about your delay sound. Yeah. There's, I mean, so is there a direct line from the DL4 to LVX as far as process goes or more just in spirit? Yeah, I uh, mean, it's in spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, Angelo uh, can definitely expand on that. Oh, yeah, no, Um it's, um, I, I got to line six right after um, they were in beta for that, uh, for the DL4. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, exactly what Terry says. It's trying to break away from preset um, notions of what delay sounds are and open it up as um, a sound design toolbox in a really straightforward way. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful um, for Gina's direction in the UI, like she has such a huge hand in this. And um, when you say modular and you say um, sound design tool by toolkit, it can sound pretty daunting. Um, but her approach is really um, methodical in how um, the different options are presented in the UI, which mm -hmm. makes it really, you know, intuitive to go about designing your own favorite delay. Yeah, I didn't need to spend like too much time you know, studying the thing. I kind of was able to dive right in, which I didn't assume I was going to be able to do right at front. Like when I got it, I was like, okay, uh, <laughs> let's put the power in and see what happens. Hopefully it doesn't bite me. Uh, but as soon as the screen popped up, I haven't, I actually haven't navigated outside of graphic mode yet, but as soon as that screen popped up and I spent, you know, maybe 20 minutes playing around with, well, actually, I spent like an hour playing with the presets that you guys have in, in there already. I was like, these are great. Yeah, totally. Uh, but once I started designing my own stuff, I was like able to navigate around and understand really quickly what and where and how things went together and how they would impact each other. You know, I think having a understanding of basic pedal board routing and different things like that helps. So if you're somebody who's used to a tube screamer and that's pretty much it, that it still may be fairly daunting. But if you've ever put together a, a pedal board of more than six pedals, I think you'll you'll understand what's going on pretty easily. That's that's the way I start that's the way I mentally approached it anyway when I would start designing different uh, delay tones and things. Yeah. Um, thanks for saying that it was uh, easy to use. I, <laughs> that makes all of us happy. Um, Gina, like Angela was saying, Gina really pushed. She um, she designed all the graphics on the user interface and had a lot of input on how it actually works too. She really pushed us to keep um, making it easy to use mm -hmm. because um, it's such a complicated thing underneath the hood that um, she wanted it to be easy uh, and not not frustrating or daunting for for any um, guitar players or musicians out there, and and I think um, I mean she accomplished that like far more than we would have been able to without her on the team. <laughs> and um, yeah, absolutely. 
So I'm super, super happy about how that turned out. I'm grateful to have her her help on that. And uh, also she just made it look beautiful too. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. And as far as, as far as, um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah, it's... Well, I'll jump in. Go ahead. Um, for the guys who are just Tube Screamer guys, you know, we thought a lot about, um, you know, customers approaching it that way too, having it be their first experience in something with a screen or a big box. Um, I mean, presets are a good entry point, but um, the graphic mode in particular is really focused and kind of um, takes you through step-by-step, step, um, you know, building a sound in, you know... Uh, if you see all the options at once, you can get a little bit lost, but it's very methodical and very smart the way Gina kind of laid it out so that it it guides your journey, you know, discovering LVX. And like you said, there's different graphic views and text views, so you can um, grow with um, the paddle as you are making discoveries along mm -hmm. the way. Yeah, it's, for me, it actually, uh, it kind of simplified. I, I make a lot of weird, like, cinematic weird music and uh it actually i was like wow this takes a lot of what i was doing with a bunch of external things and i'm able to build something in that maybe not identical but in that same spirit all in that one pedal which spurred my idea so i don't know if gina told you but because i haven't released it yet but i took that pedal my recording interface and my and my laptop to Nashville with me on this recent trip. And because I was by myself in the evenings in the hotel room, I was like, well, I can either watch Netflix or I can try to make something. And so I just, I used that into the new Benson Amps plugins uh, because that's what I oh, play cool. at home. Wow. And I was able to make something very much in my normal vein that I would normally need like, like, like literally like 15 different pedals to to create and I was able to do it all with LVX and uh it was really satisfying I was like this is this is kind of cool because I I literally just had like everything the only thing I didn't bring with me that I needed I borrowed a guitar because I knew I was going to Nashville I'm like not going to be hard to find a guitar to borrow this will be easy <laughs> for sure <laughs> but, oh man it's it was, great for guitar there yeah yeah so I wasn't too concerned about that but I everything else I literally had on my back and I was able to like make a fully produced what I think sounds great, like weird little uh, cinematic sketch of sorts. And uh, yeah, it, I don't think I could have done that with anything else, the way, just the way I work. That's rad, yeah. That's awesome. yeah, we, um, yeah. we tried pretty hard to, to push the boundaries of what a delay is, and this thing is more than a delay in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Um, the thing that I was going to say before that I, that, uh, I, I couldn't remember was that, uh, we, we kind of got in the product development, a, a, a um, sorry, one of our neighbors is yelling outside. <laughs> <laughs> we, and the, the product development got to the point to where we were, um, thinking, oh, this thing's maybe easy enough to use to where you almost don't even need a user manual. So that was like. That was a point where we knew we were accomplishing something that was going to be user friendly. Mm -hmm. So, did you guys have to go sort of like you've had you know a lot of pretty advanced pedals for a long time? Uh, obviously, they're in s smaller formats, but this is this is something else altogether. In fact, it seems like if I'm understanding the story correctly, there are elements from almost everything that you've made in the past packed into here. Did you have to like go to a totally different architecture with this one? Are we able to base some of it on what you've done before, or what was the under the hood stuff like? So from the from the hardware point of view, we did go to a whole new architecture, the same type of processor. Uh, we've always used ARM processors, but um, uh, this one's just like far, far, far more powerful. So we've got way more processing power, way more memory, um, all that stuff, uh, is just makes it a more capable product from a hardware point of view. And then, uh, Angela was able to reuse, you know, because of the similarities, a, the, a lot of it had to be written from the ground up, but Angela was able to reuse a lot of our like algorithms that we had already developed. 
Oh, nice. Yeah, there's a lot of um, little, you know, filters and different little processing elements that I wanted to have in a delay context that I, I wanted to like in, integrate with the delay. So um, like Terry mentions, they're both ARM platforms. Um, and so um, I was able to take a lot of those elements and bring them to LVX um, along with a whole bunch of, you know, exciting new stuff too. There's tons and tons of new algorithms and stuff we haven't done before. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice mix. You get to have, you know, pieces of Hedra and Polymoon are, other two delays in side of LVX, but you can combine them in completely unique ways and make you know all new um, different mm -hmm. soundscapes. So when you guys, you know, we we didn't really talk about this the first time you came on, and I'm going to put it in the intro. But for anybody who is not familiar with Maris, you should go back and listen to their first episode. But one thing I didn't get into you, with you guys in that I don't, at least not to my memory, is like what inspires you? Like what kind of music do you guys listen to to because there's nobody else doing the type of stuff that you guys are doing and it really has inspired me to do things i never would have ever thought of before sometimes i look at maris pedals and i go like how do they even think to make this a thing like so where where do your inspirations come from with this stuff um well thank you thank you for for the huge compliment that is as mm -hmm. rad to hear that that um our stuff is inspiring anybody. It's like a, it's like a humbling thing to be able to create, um, whether it's hardware or software or, or something that comes together, like what we make and, or artwork or anything and have it be inspiring somebody else. I, um, I think we get inspiration from all the mediums, you know, like visual art, um, Definitely music, even movies, even comedy. We talked about that a little bit on your first, uh, mm -hmm. on your on, on the first uh, interview with you. And uh, yeah, sometimes we play comedy in the office. <laughs> I, Blake, I remember you got Gina a comedy record one time as a Christmas gift. Yes, yes, yes. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Still have the vinyl. Um, awesome. Yeah, we play all kinds of stuff in the office. I guess for me, um, you know, I listen to all types of music, a lot of metal still. Ah, um, my man. I grew up in more of the punk rock and metal type of type of vein, but now uh, that stuff is not always super compatible with like the work environment. So a lot of electronic music. Mm -hmm. I love like Calm Trues. I love Square Pusher, Apex Twin, um, you know, ambient stuff. Um, classical music sometimes we just play like a movie on the wall like a, with a projector or like comedy special or something and uh yeah we do all kinds of stuff yeah i'm, I'm super grateful that like terry said that you find um, our sounds inspiring in our work i mean um it's definitely a creative endeavor for all of us you know it's our creative outlet as well as you know um something that uh we just want to add to the community of awesome musical tools. Um, in, like Terry mentions, um, music is a huge inspiration, obviously. <laughs> and in the and and uh, Terry's um, mentioned before that Andy Summers is a huge um, kind of influence and pioneer on the way he uses gear. Um, I, it's a little strange to say it this way, but it's almost like when we release our art and our creations out into the world, it really feels like a conversation with musicians and um, mm -hmm. who end up using it. It's really gratifying to see people use presets or use sounds that you've created. And in a way, they're kind of communicating with you because it's something that you've put out there to have them experience and then they're interacting with it in a musical way. So it's this interesting long distance communication. And I, I feel inspired by um, you know, the engineers who came before us, you know, who um, worked at these legendary companies, like I'm always digging into old gear and kind of like seeing their thought process and feeling the other end of that conversation and kind of learning. And so that that whole community of, of music and sharing is, is just super gratifying. And I'm super um, grateful to, you know, have the opportunity to to be a part oh, of it. Me too. Yeah. I, I forgot okay. to mention Andy Summers, actually. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite guitar player ever. 
<laughs> and synthesizers. Synthesizers yeah, are like, uh, you know, around us in the lab and kind of a constant like hardware inspiration for sure. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, LVX definitely has synth inspired heritage and being able to bring that to a pedal board and um, to musicians who, you know, don't normally interact with synths. Um, there's a lot of power there and a lot of, you know, great opportunities for expression. So, you know, we're, we're happy to bring new stuff that are, you know, new sounds and algorithms that are inspired by synths for sure. So, but Angela, as far as like specific artists and things, is there anybody that pops to your mind where you're like, oh, I was trying to, you know, insert artist here, you know, do something, something along those lines when I made this algorithm or is there anything? Uh, you, you know, it's more like I, I hope I can make something okay, that they want to use. <laughs> like the the tools, the tools that they used already exist. You know, um, um, Andy Summers, um, Holdsworth, no longer with us. Zappa, no longer with us. The 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 tools that they used, and um, super grateful for Terry. He bought me a really great um, book on uh, Zappa's gear, and I just like devoured that book. But those tools already exist, so I think. Um, part of it is, man, I hope I can make something that, you know, those artists or the next generation of artists are, you know, feel is worthy and, and inspires them. So, yeah, I would love, and I, I, whenever we see someone using it, that's why I mentioned the conversation, you know, when we see them using it on YouTube or, you know, Instagram, it's yeah. super gratifying. Yeah. There's a lot of people, do you ever see somebody using something you made and you're like, huh, never thought to use it that way. <laughs> like that's not what I had in mind all the time yeah yeah I yeah, was uh, even though I had obviously spent quite a bit of time poking around uh, in LVX I did not clearly spend enough time because I just watched uh, Stefan from the Pedal Zone I watched his demo and I was like huh I didn't find that I've got to find <laughs> that <laughs> he always makes awesome sounding stuff yeah oh man he just has he's like so a good. real knack for for that yeah yeah, yeah he's, and he's even great. besides other artists, I'm like uh, so lucky to be able to work with the team that I work with that's inspiring just as much as anybody else. You know, like Gina will show me stuff, or like I'll see a photo she made, she took, or um, you know, some kind of graphic she created, or Angela, he just hear him playing, or like talking about something, or mentioning something, and it's just constant eye opening new experiences that I'm so lucky to be able to be a part of. I feel like definitely the least important m member of the team sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Come on. <laughs> we are blessed with an amazing team. Like I, I, I totally, totally second that. Like we have um, the collaboration and the ability to like, um, you know, work together to bring new, you know, things to the uh, world is just amazing. And yeah, we have, incredible inspiring people and now let's see last time you came on there was still just the three of you i believe but i believe the team has yeah. expanded somewhat now is that yeah, we right? expanded in a really good way um actually yeah the last time we talked to you we angelo and gina and i were still even like doing the shipping by ourselves i think we were trading off three days a week even one day one person would do the shipping one yeah. day a week one day a week and trade off like uh, now there's six of us so not huge not a huge difference but um i guess double so still yeah. still a small company but we added awesome uh software engineer uh named john and uh awesome hardware slash manufacturing engineer and alex and um awesome customer service slash uh shipping guy Luis. There you go. And nice. uh, yeah, that's our team now. Ever ever expanding. That's awesome. Yeah, super grateful. Yeah. Alex Alex oh, really? the deal for. Well, yes, we Go get him. Alex Bring him in here. Over, Where's he at? Over 20 years. Oh, <laughs> oh really? <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, yeah. He, maybe he should be on yeah. one of these days. That would be yeah, fun. He's amazing. Um, for sure. So, you know, kind of moving forward, it's probably a little bit hard to think beyond where you're at currently because it took so long to get this out into the world. It's kind of like, all right, the, the baby's here. Woo. And now somebody's immediately going to be like, so are you going to have another one? 
You know, like, are you already <laughs> thinking about, you know, what's next? Or are you just kind of right now just trying to manage this beast? Oh, yeah. It feels like we've been working on it forever. It's been like, man, a real, real challenge all the way through from, you know, pandemic to all the part shortages that you hear about to trying to make it oh, in yeah. the U.S., which is sometimes ironically harder than trying to make it in China or something. Um yeah, to just actually making the huge investment because yeah. this project has taken a lot longer than our others and has been way more expensive. So um, yeah, just keeping the business going while we're while we're doing this has been like a, like a big challenge for all of us and fun at the same time and took a long time. Uh, yeah, it's been all those things. Yeah. And, a, and an, another reason to be grateful. Um, yeah. Terry is being humble. Like he steers the ships and, and keeps us running amid all those challenges. It's just been amazing. Um, yeah, t- I'm always, um, always looking for Terry for, you know, business experience <laughs> and um, kind of like the way f- it's su- been super challenging. And so I feel lucky to have um, yeah, Terry and Gina by my side to help guide us through, you know, troubled waters. But you know, we're making, you know, amazing stuff. So we have, you know, just, yeah, yeah, I mean, I won't talk about any future plans, but, but, um, (laughs) I mean, we do have this sweet new platform now. That's what I, that's true. That's kind of what I was, kind of what I was, uh, imagining. It's like, I know this is not the end for this format. Very, very powerful, very flexible. Um, and uh, to go back to like some of the challenges, actually, Blake, uh, you probably know about this one. I'm sure you've heard other people talk about it, but like in the 2020, after uh, maybe six months after the pandemic started, we learned that the only company in the world that makes our analog to digital converters um, burned to the ground in yeah, Japan. Yeah, that so was cool. Yeah, that's great. That was a terrible, like, um, kind of life preserver type of situation where everybody who used the parts that we use had to like pivot really fast. And uh, that was like a big rescue mission that we pulled off luckily somehow. But um <laughs> but yeah we got we gotten through everything so far so thankful for that. Yeah, this is this is definitely like a very interesting time in you know this kind of global economy that we we have you know, some, somewhat anyway, I, I didn't really see, and I should have, like, I feel like I'm try to keep my ear to the ground with this stuff because the stuff that happens at string joy is impacted by this too. Even though pretty much all the manufacturing happens in the U S there are still like little bits and pieces here and pieces of equipment and different things that do get sourced elsewhere. Oh, and yeah. it's, it's like, I should have seen this supply stuff coming before I did. I, I felt like I felt like I was a little bit early to it in the gear world as far as who I, I was I remember talking to Joel and a few other people like, hey, the, you know, we're we're I think we're in for something extra weird even after like this initial lockdown period. I think we were this is going to have some impacts. And even then, I feel like I was a little bit late to that. And it also was much worse than I had even thought it was going to be. Um, the amount of inventory we have to keep on hand down there in Nashville now is like absurd compared to oh, yeah. what it used to be, just just so that we don't have interruptions, you know? Um, yeah, inventory is inventory's so hard to deal with yeah, exactly. from a business point of view, you know, because if you're an owner and um, you're having to keep lots of backlog just to, just to keep um, keep your supply up, properly you can't pay yourself for a while you know because all right. that money is like not it's just not available it's just sitting there on the shelf and that's what yes. a lot of people don't understand the, the other downside is you know come tax yeah. time what a lot of people don't understand is guess what you've paid all that money to have all that sit there on the shelf not only can you not get the money out of it right now but you also have to pay taxes on it too mm-hmm. which is great <laughs> it's like, oh, thanks, thanks for your help, uh, and a lot of people <laughs> I don't think understand that. 
Yeah. It does seem weird, right? I've never really understood that. Like, if you buy equipment or if you buy, you know, office supplies or whatever, that's an expense. But if you buy the essential thing to operate your business, that also costs – it's – I don't understand. It's It seems like a very backwards tax law to me. Um, I'm sure somebody's benefiting from it somewhere, but it isn't me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vincent, and I'm here to talk about the Maris Mercury X. My dad's always going on and on about how cool Maris is. He really went off on one about the Mercury X the other day. He said something about a 4,800 hertz sample rate and 99 preset locations in 33 banks. And something along the lines of the most advanced reverb pedal ever devised by man? That's all true, but I only care about one thing. This pedal sounds sick. So make sure you check out the Mercury X and all the other fine products at Maris.us, as well as fine retailers worldwide. All right, Dad, now can I have my pocky? How exactly do artists get their music on Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, Tidal, all these services? How in the world do you get your music there? Well, in the past, you had to use something called a record label. But these days, you can use DistroKid. DistroKid is the absolute easiest way to get your music up on streaming services. And it's the most affordable way to do so. Not only do plans start at $22.99 for the entire year, that's less than 2 bucks a month, DistroKid also does not take a cut of your streaming revenue, unlike some other services out there. Even better if you sign up by going to ToneMob.com slash DistroKid. That's ToneMob.com slash DistroKid. One more time, that's ToneMob.com slash DistroKid. You'll get 30% off. That's right, 30% off. They're already extremely reasonable prices. So go to ToneMob.com slash DistroKid and get your music out there. Yeah, I mean, just manufacturing under the best conditions is a challenge. <laughs> even yes. without tariffs and supply chain, like even under the best conditions, manufacturing is always a challenge. So it's, mm-hmm. yeah, been super yeah, compounded. Hopefully, hopefully this is not a boring subject for people. and <laughs> They may be tiring, tired of hearing about it. But yeah, like uh, I mean, a good example is that we ordered, let's see, we ordered the parts to build the pedals that we're going to build this summer like almost two years ago before the design was oh my um even finished like even close to being finished we just had to kind of guess like these are probably the parts that we're going to use <laughs> ouch <laughs> uh, and then if they're not well too bad you know if we're like, not, they're not we have to eat the cost yeah or try to use them somewhere else mm-hmm. that's yeah these are the things i mean some people might think it's boring but i do think it's worth getting out there for consumers because some people just, you know, they just, I want it and I want it now and I want it there in two days because Jeff Bezos set that precedent and that's what we're going to do. That is a big Uh, problem, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, And they don't realize that like, hey, there's there's six people here that are trying to make this happen. You know, there's a handful of people. This isn't Amazon and there's going to be issues and uh for the most part, uh, in the the boutique, I guess you want to call that co- guitar community, a lot of the a lot of the customers are pretty understanding of that as long as they're communicated with. But sometimes, sometimes I get emails coming through. I'm like, buddy, you do not know how the world works, do you? Like this is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this is rough. And people um, are understandably frustrated. You know, like you, you might have just had a had a child recently, and you can't have you can't get baby formula. Like, what's going on? Right. I mean, and that's terrible, you know, yeah. because some some people really really need that, you know. It's not an option, and then mm-hmm. so you gotta you gotta do what you gotta do in those instances, and it's a it's a weird world we're living in <laughs> right now. It's a uh, I don't see it uh, I don't see it getting too much smoother anytime soon, but hopefully hopefully there's some light at the end of the tunnel here. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, you gotta have optimism. Well, I actually yeah, was talking so. to my mom about this uh, a little while ago. It sounds kind of weird, but you know, I was going, man, these last few years have been really like, wow. 
And then we got to thinking about it, and it's like, it's always weird. We just know about it more now. Like, you go back to the, the like, 60s and 70s, especially when we, like, really can see some very well-documented world history. I'm like, man, JFK got shot. We're in Vietnam. We're doing this. Oh, now there's an oil crisis, blah, blah. Like, they, it's always been weird. There's always, like, something difficult to contend with uh, it, as far as humans go. And I don't think that's ever not been the case. It just feels like a lot more now because of social media and our constantly connected world. At least that's my my theory I'm going with, is that it's always been weird. We just have to deal with it. I think so. I think it's been a little extra, extra weird lately. Yeah, there's I, always... I, I do... Yeah. I, there are like little nuggets of, of uh, things that I, I think are good that wouldn't have happened. Like, you know, I spent just being stuck at home. I spent hours just, you know, with my daughter that I probably wouldn't have been able to when she was four, you know, like growing up, mm -hmm. just pushing her on a swing in the backyard or something. Um, so, so that's cool. You know, looking back, there's some of those things I can, I can appreciate better now, like looking back than at the time. I, I do appreciate the customers who are patient with us for sure. I appreciate yeah. them very much because um, things just do take longer now. And, and we do get a lot of positive feedback from people. Yeah, it's... A yeah, even when times are challenging, there's always the opportunity to learn from those challenges so, and, and grow from those challenges. But Yeah, I think they, uh, they really help, you know, define kind of the vision a little bit more. Like, how bad do we really want to do this? And how bad do we really really want to do this and you know and it's fine if, if for some people the answer is ah, not that bad i'm i'm out that's fine but i think it does help sharpen and and uh and help you to get to know yourself a little bit in a in a weird way with yeah 100 <clears throat> percent. maybe i've, a I've little said this too on the much podcast. perspective right Beck? Yeah, <laughs> too much perspective. <laughs> that's true it's true <laughs> i didn't ask for this much perspective <laughs> 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 yeah, I remember Josh Scott actually, and I've I've said this on the podcast multiple times. I remember a smaller pedal company owner coming up to him at a NAM, uh, at, actually at the uh, the bowling party that EQD and him used to throw, and he said, "What's the number one thing you would say to a, you know a newer manufacturer in this space? Like, what's what's the number one piece of advice you could give?" And it was, he was like, stick around. He was like, if you can just stick around, like you'll be doing better than many, many people. It's like, just as long as you can just hang in there. Cause it's just showing up is actually <laughs> half the battle. <laughs> I was just thinking about this the other day. Um, yeah, I was like, uh, cause we've been around eight years now wow. and or more, a little more than eight years now. And I was just thinking, wow, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of have done it, you know, it's, it's always so uncertain at the beginning and then just so many years pass and you don't even realize that. Mm -hmm. And then you have all these, all these products out and, uh, customers that, that are supporting you and like, uh, all these new people, you know, and it's, and it's really cool. Eight years is a long time to have been doing anything. Like really, I, I had careers that only lasted eight years and then I moved on and you know, or le or less in some cases with my last job. Uh, I mean, geez, I'm I actually just the other day I got a notification. It was a uh, like my four year anniversary since I left my last job, and so it was like, whoa, I've I've been at this four years full time. I didn't know that I wasn't even sure that that was a possibility when I got started. So yeah, I I can understand the feeling. Um, so in in those eight years, you know, you guys were already in the industry for a while before that. Obviously, lots of a lot of things have changed, and a lot of uh, as we've we've harped on for a while now. There's a lot of chaos going on. But if somebody was to want to start a a pedal company or just anything in the MI industry, since you guys have a lot of experience with a lot of that, what would you what would you suggest to somebody is just dipping their toe in the water? Oof. I want to think about that for a second. Um, but the first thing that comes to mind, I would say, 
I think the perseverance advice is good, but I also think like um, try to keep things like as small and efficient as you can for a while. At least that's the mm-hmm. way we've we've tried to do it. Yeah. Um, don't get it. Don't get in over your head. Um, definitely with expenses. Yeah, definitely keep keep things small, but um, um, be sure that you're following your heart and your passion. You know that that'll help pull you through those times where you need to persevere. Is having that connection and that love for what you're doing and creating um and it's it shows through too if you if you love what you're doing someone's bound to feel that on the other side so um yeah be be um be smart about growing but also be passionate be really passionate about what you're making yeah that's probably even even more important advice yeah i love that and i think that's really important to note because i think it's pretty obvious to any of the listeners of this show at this point, but if you're getting into this world because you see yourself being the next Jeff Bezos, uh, you're, you're not doing the right thing. Like it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, you can be, you can be comfortable, right? Like you Mm -hmm. can make a good living, but you're not going to be, you're not going to be a billionaire. It's just there. I mean, look around how many am I industry billionaires are there? Uh, not, very many. I can't even think of one off the top of my head. Actually. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> so. that's definitely definitely true for our industry. I, I think um, our one of our great mentors, Michelle Dwadik, who was co founder of Line Six. He t- I remember him telling me one time, uh, "Don't worry about the money too much. Like uh, the money is like actually not the fun part of right. running a business." I 100 percent believe him when he says that. He was totally being honest about it, um, and I, I agree with him. It's not the fun part. It's a requirement, but it's not the fun part. Like the right, it you yeah. have to pay attention to that stuff. You have to in order to keep the the lights on. But at the end of the day, I think it's the experiences that you get from being able to be involved in this. Sometimes I've referred to it somewhat as a like the lack of like huge financial financial gain that you'll see is sort of the tax you pay for like being able to work in something that you're really passionate about and you get to meet really cool people maybe at least in my case sometimes even some of your favorite artists that you've like listened to for years and years you end up getting to meet through this and i don't think that would have happened if i was a paper towel salesman you know i oh, yeah, <laughs> really don't cool think people. that would ever happen yeah really cool people meeting cool people is a huge uh benefit i think that i didn't realize at first um Mm -hmm. but um yeah like even listening to your show i can listen to you know jamie from earthquaker talk or joel talk or uh hopefully one day steve will come on your show from empress i'm trying Um, i'm trying good people all good people Mm -hmm. that i love and and (laughs) and i don't think there's any other industries where you can like root for your competition as much and be like excited for somebody else's success yeah, I do I just, think that I really is like actually that about, a rarity. Um, about music here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's nice because I mean, and I think why that is is because most musicians who are really passionate about this stuff, they're not just gonna play one pedal. They're not just gonna play even one guitar. You know, most of the time they'll have a couple and they'll change things around on them and they'll have a board that's ever evolving and swapping in and out and and that is conducive to being able to root for your competition, you know? Cause like, Hey, we all Definitely. win. That's right. A, that's a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not very many other things like that. With that in mind, outside of music and creative endeavors, do you guys have any like interests or hobbies that people might be surprised to find out that you guys are into? Like I'm a car guy. I don't talk about it all that much, but I talk about it a little bit. Like, do you guys have any other things that get you excited in a similar way? Oh, um, yes, for sure. Um, I mean, I like art. Mm-hmm. Actually, um, I remember going to like the, uh, well, we used to be able to travel more, but one time we got to travel, Gina and I got to travel to Spain and we went to the Guggenheim wow. and saw the Richard Serra art exhibit uh, where his massive steel structures. And I was telling Angelo about it. I was like, this is the most amazing reverb and delay sounds I've ever heard. You walk inside of them because they're like, you know, 20, 30 feet tall. And then if you say something or clap, then you can hear all the reflections. So, yeah, I love art. Um, I don't get to create a lot of art 
outside of the, the company uh, recently. Um, I play a lot of guitar when I can with friends and stuff. And other than that, it's mostly, you know, dedicated to my, my now seven-year-old daughter. Yeah. Yep. I cook a lot. I like cooking. Oh, now <laughs> we're talking. <laughs> now now so we're Gina, talking. Actually, she is an excellent, excellent cook. Uh, That's awesome. Well, now we'll have plenty pandemic. to dive into on, on the Patreon section. Uh, we'll just be talking about cooking <laughs> the whole time, I'm sure. Well, I guess, I guess during all the <laughs> lockdown periods, we, we got so good at cooking that restaurants kind of became like a slight disappointment sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can relate to that. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm very, I'm very picky with where, where I tend to eat out these days. I can relate. Right, right. Angelo, how about you? Um, so yeah, the pandemic, puts a damper on everything. Uh, uh, I, I love gardening. Um, I love, you know, taking care of stuff around the house. Um, uh, I, I love doing that with my daughter. I got her a bunch of, uh, gardening stuff for Christmas. Um, and it's a way we can bond and she's really into nature and she's really into, um, you know, small creatures and kind of, you know, just experiencing that. So, um, that I love doing that. I love going on hikes and kind of seeing her interact with with nature and taking care of nature just in a small way, just you know, mm -hmm. in our own little garden. Yeah, the kids. Oh, one uh, thing is so cool. Oh, Blake, go uh, ahead. sorry to interject, but uh, no, Angela, go for it. One thing is so rad is that uh, Angelo's daughter is only a year older than mine, right, Angela? Maybe a little bit more. She's oh, she's two she's years nine. older than my daughter. So, but they're close enough to where they're like friends and they get to hang out. Nice. So it was like an unexpected bonus. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Of uh, life. Yeah. You, you love it when that kind of thing happens. You yeah. Know, you always hope You always hope that it will. Yeah. But sometimes it's like, oh, you're going to hang out with that person. All right. Well, dad's going to go over here for a little bit so he doesn't have to talk to that dad. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's awesome when it, it becomes uh, like your friends and, and partners, you know, that uh, – that whole community can kind of grow closer in that way through your kids, you know? Yeah. And, they uh, can hang out totally. while we hang out. Yeah. Definitely. That's great. But, uh, the kids, uh, I don't know this, I guess this is turning into dad talk a little bit, but <laughs> having, having kids really was, uh, it was more than I ex expected as far as a change in, in myself. You know, I, Waited a little bit longer than maybe my wife would have liked to have, but uh, you know we we're still relatively young. But when when my son was born, it was like I thought I knew like I thought I knew what love was before that. I was pretty sure I had a pretty good grasp on it, but I feel like the like capacity for it grew like ten times as soon as he was born. I was like, oh. Oh, oh yeah. I'm I'm a different person now. Like and it sounds all and I've told my friends that don't have kids like it sounds really cliché and dumb everything that you hear about that like being a parent. For me, all of the clichés have been true. Like there's there's nothing there's nobody on the planet I could love more than my little dudes. There's just like like burning yeah. building. Yes, I'm deep, going like, in. This is getting deep. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it is totally Sometimes. true though. Yeah, the the <laughs> the capacity for love definitely uh is just massively multiplied. I agree. I I my my daughter is um right now more of an uh visual artist than a musician. She does love mm -hmm. music though. I I'm trying to get her to play guitar. I I bought her like a little purple Ibanez shred looking nice. guitar. Nice. Yes. It is sweet, but um it's it's more of a challenge to get that. I think guitar is like a hard instrument for for a little kid compared to you know like um, compared to other stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've gotten uh, Vincent's taking drum lessons currently, and uh, yes. that's going oh, awesome. going like surprisingly well because I'm a terrible drummer, and so I kind of just assumed that you know my, he's such a he's such a mini me in so many ways like. His personality, his like, <laughs> his like, squirrel, ah, like uh, that's that's <laughs> like me a hundred percent. You know, I can see it all over all over the place. So I was like, I don't know if drums are going to be his thing, but that's what he says he wants to try. And we have a drum set here, 
and he has the shred shed that he can practice in whenever, pretty much whenever I'm not recording. And uh, yeah, he's he's picking it up pretty well. So that's pretty exciting to see. And his teacher has been really great. And I'm just, I don't want to be the, uh, I've said this before, but like I want him to play music really bad, but I don't want to be the stereotypical like force my kid to do something dad just because I'm passionate about it. You're going to like it too. Uh, I don't want to be that. I want it to be genuine. But at the same time, I think, you know, they have to be exposed to these things to have any idea of what they're going to like or what they're not going to like. I mean, I think that's true for, for any pursuit. I definitely agree. Uh, yeah. At least, at least for my kids, um, it's hard. They, they're, they're getting more interested in, in performing music and using instruments, but, for the longest time, it was just, oh, that's dad's right. thing. I'm not going to even try. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard to like get them motivated um, to to be interested in something. It's cool, like Blake. That. You can jam with him. And uh, the good thing about being a drummer is you never have trouble finding a band. Everybody always needs a drummer. Yeah, that's right. A drummer usually plays in multiple bands, and <laughs> yeah, and that they're always in always in need. Yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he how he shakes out here in a few years if he still likes that or wants to move on to something else. I don't know. Pokemon is coming on pretty strong right now. It's really the thing. So may, things may take a backseat to Pokemon. I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, yeah. With so when you you're saying Angelo that like that's Dad's thing, was it more like? that's dad's thing and we don't want involved because it's not cool? Or is it more like, oh, we don't even know where to begin with this? Because for me, when my dad was playing guitar, I was like, I don't even know how he's doing that. Like, that, he must be magical. Like, I don't understand any of this. It, <laughs> <laughs> at least at least for me, uh, dad's thing was extremely uncool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. No um, way. But, um, I can't believe they thought they're, that. They're definitely coming around. Um, uh, my middle son is really into... Um, um, playing a trombone and he's in the jazz band and he's learning uh, music production so we'll see it's it's becoming less less uncool as they're getting deeper into music that's cool yeah and sometimes they have to find their own things you know like i yeah my dad's music was cool but i didn't really know it at the time i had to discover my own things and then find his music a little bit later and like oh yeah actually he he was on something here <laughs> yeah i think that's more of it yeah yeah. Where where it's like, um, yeah, you want to have your own thing first, then you can go back mm -hmm. and and appreciate. Yeah. We are brought to you today by Sweetwater, specifically the Gear Exchange. You may have heard about this. This is a place where you can go to buy and sell your used gear. Maybe you got a pedal over there that's just kind of collecting dust. Maybe there's something you've been eyeing from the Sweetwater catalog. Well, Right now is a great time to turn that unused gear into something you're actually going to use. Even better, if you sell on the gear exchange, you can keep 100% of the sale as long as you choose a Sweetwater gift card as your payout method. That is not too shabby, because let's be honest, most of this buying and selling we do is just to fund new gear purchases, and that is a great way to reach a wide variety of customers and keep 100% in your pocket, or rather, on your pedal board. So go check out the Sweetwater Gear Exchange and turn that unused gear into something that's actually going to help you write that next huge riff. Hello there. I'd like to introduce you to your new best friend, the Chase Bliss Audio Long Scene. Lossy is a collaboration between Chase Blitz and Good Hertz. Well, it's meant to give you some control over those weird digital artifacts that come with every compressed audio. You're getting it right now. All the changes that are taking place are strictly coming from my playing dynamics. I'm just interacting with the pedal and letting it do its thing. And some true stereo goodness. If you'd like some more details about Lossy, 
I invite you to head over to chaseblintzaudio.com. I think you're going to like what you find. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's just a, a totally different perspective. Now, now I look look at my kids, and I'm like, ah, now I understand why my dad did that back in the day, and why he, <laughs> why he said those things to me. I, I thought he was just an old codger, but no, now I, now I'm the old codger yelling at the clouds. That's me. So this is a bit of a segue from what we were talking about, but it was something I wanted to get into with you guys. So. Considering you have been around for eight years now, and the only way that people find out about things is if they are marketed in some way, shape, or form, how have your guys' approach to social media and content and just the whole weird world of the internet that we live in these days, has that evolved over time or have you been fairly consistent? Like, what's, What are your thoughts on the ever-changing social media landscape? I um, feel fortunate to not be super involved in that part of the business. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Gina um, really like handles a hundred percent of that, which is which is great because she does way a better job than I think anybody out there. Um, totally. It uh, yeah, just like really authentic, really real. I'm um, trying to be artful and thoughtful about everything be very um engaging with mm -hmm. people uh be very appreciative of people and um yeah i just think it's it's i think it's done in a very classy way and it's it's evolved over time just as far as the amount of work that needs to be put into it uh, as we've as we like become a little bit bigger of a business um but yeah i think um I think the quality of the content is always really, really, really great. Yeah, and obviously, it, like Gina is, she takes great photos and she does a lot of that too. But let's talk about that that video for LVX. Like, how, mm. ha, just how, how did that happen? <laughs> I, was, I was watching this. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> when's the movie coming out? I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> oh, me too. I was blown away by it too. Uh, that's another thing we got lucky on. She. She kind of like create, came up with the whole whole concept and creatively directed the thing, but um, we wouldn't have been able to do it uh, without a director, Joey, that we know, and a musician, Matt, uh, Makeup and Vanity Set, who uh, did the music for it. And then Joey's wife was the actress in the in the movie. We, um, the story was just was we got super lucky that that uh, Joey was about to take a trip to Iceland. So he had an opportunity to get, to get amazing footage and he's already a great film director as it is. So uh, Gina hired him and uh, it all came together really organically and turned out like, I mean, it completely blew my mind the first time I saw it. I was like, whoa, it's like, <laughs> is this going to be on HBO Max or something? I think somebody else, I think somebody else said that too. Yeah, it's it's brilliant. I loved it. I I think those kinds of things are sort of easily overlooked uh, occasionally, uh, the, like the in-house creation of things. And I thought that was just a such a cool. It, I mean, it, it just got me all hyped. I already knew what it was, and I was I was still hyped about it. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Know? you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We get sometimes we get great. sometimes we get as excited about that part of it as the as the product itself, and it like goes into kind of our um, our two-tiered approach of a product is where uh, on the one side it's the product that we want it to be an instrument. On the other side, we have a conceptual kind of uh, art piece that we want it to be and to go along with it and accompany it. That sounds really serious, but we have like, we have fun <laughs> with it. Yeah, and, um, tons of fun, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the art, the art aspect of this one turned out turned out really, 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 really cool really really well yeah i i saw some people before the full name was revealed like you know just the way the the lines that were forming lvx was coming some people were like is this gonna have something to do with aliens and i was like ha ah, i love aliens i don't know oh, if this yeah? has anything well, to do with it i don't it. know if you know but that's that's gina's favorite movie so so there was definitely i an forgot but i did know the, that there, yeah. there was an influence there in the um 
in the text of that. And that those initial images were a 3D, a different artist that didn't work on the movie, but he did some still 3D images for us. Oh, wow. That's incredible. I love that. Well, we are, we're nearing the end of the main episode of the podcast. And, you know, it's been a long time since you guys have come on. And in fact, I don't even remember if I asked you guys, I know I asked you guys about pizza last time. Yep. And I'm, I'm assuming that your views on pizza have probably not changed a lot. You they guys seem like. progressed a little bit. I have a little bit to add to the pizza story. Do you I'll have? You, okay. I'll let, you, I'll let you finish. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's get into it. Like, how have your pizza views changed since the <laughs> last time you came on the show? So, last time I was talking about my brother's pizza, which I still love, but he doesn't cook for me very often. So, um, mm-hmm. Gina started making pizza in the pandemic. Mm-hmm. She, I think, oh, what is it? Oh, it's a Bobby Flay, uh, like, crust. Mm. Okay. So, it's weird. You make it in the barbecue. And it is delicious. Mm. You make it in the barbecue, the, the whole pizza. You do the crust first and then pizza afterwards. Anyways, um, she makes awesome pizza now. Um, so that's t- adding to the pizza story. But uh, I heard a rumor that you've been talking about tacos recently. I have been talking about tacos recently. Um, I like tacos a lot. I like, you know, the, the real truth of it is I like, I like to eat. <laughs> like I really, really like to eat, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, I don't see that stopping anytime soon. So yeah, as much as I talk about pizza, I think I've come around to, you know, with my wife. Uh, she's said for a long time, if there was one regional cuisine that she had to eat for the rest of her life, it would be Mexican food. Mm. And I kind of pushed back on that for a little while, but I think I've come around. Like, yeah, it would probably be Mexican food. If I just couldn't eat anything else ever again, that it would be. Like, I really love, like, good street tacos. We have a great tamale place nearby. I can't get enough of those tamales. It's, uh, you can see I got pretty excited. Oh, man, I'm right there with you. (laughs) But, yeah, big fan of the tacos. Means but so. Angela, what what about you? I got to direct the pizza thing your way. Are you so, still uh, yeah, pizza same... wise, I'm still my views have not evolved too much. I'm still that little star pizza in um, San Francisco is still top of my list. Um, yeah, I I mean, Mexican food is great. Like we have tons of great places to eat in Ventura. <laughs> um, we have an amazing. I like these um, uh, fish tacos at um, uh, Pierpont um, Tacos. Um, which was close to us, really great. Um, yeah, we're, we live in an abundance of wonderful tacos. I think if I had to have one cuisine that I had to stick with forever would be um, my grandma's cooking. <laughs> She's Italian. She grew up there ah. and kind of like, you know, um, she was a nanny, like a governess, and she like learned how to cook for these kids. And she was just an amazing cook, so uh, amazing chef. And um, she's, that's like, that's where my heart is, that food. But um, But yeah. Uh, Mexican cuisine is a solid choice and we partake every week. We love it. (laughs) (laughs) Taco Tuesday. (laughs) Yeah, I can do, I can do Mexican food a lot. (laughs) Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot. Yeah. And I do, I I do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Quite frequently. Well, okay. With that out of the way, I mean, that's all very important, but I don't believe I asked you guys. And if I did, I'm sorry. My brain, I have a lot of conversations and you know, things got to, they got to leave. The files get full and something has to leave. But I don't believe I asked you guys about your favorite boss pedals last time. And apologies if I did and I forgot, but we can talk about it again. What are your favorite boss pedals? I think I did do this one because I'm pretty sure I ended up at Metal Zone. Yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't yeah, think you asked is, us directly, yeah. but it was, yeah, might have been is, Metal um, Zone. You were, you were asking us about uh, gear that influenced us. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, maybe okay. it wasn't specific specifically boss, yeah. about boss pedal. I just ended up yeah. at a boss pedal. You had just pedal, got the metal zone. I don't. That's not my favorite pedal. Okay, that's right. I do have kind of a new favorite pedal. That's what? like a classic. Uh, I was on a chorus hunt for a long time, and um, I bought all the boss choruses, and I was like, that's eh, not quite it. And then I got a small clone, a EH small clone. Mm-hmm. That's what it is, right? Yeah. Small clone. Not small stone. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, man, that's my favorite chorus. That's like such a good chorus. There you go. 
I think it's a really yeah, stone deep is chorus. The... Small stone is a phaser, right? Phaser, yeah. I was going to say yeah. phaser yeah. or flanger. So it's yeah. a small phaser. clone. Yeah. Um, it's like, I think, what was on like uh, Sanitarium and maybe some Nirvana songs. Oh. It's, it's oh, a good is that chorus. what that is? I think so. Every, t- every time I plug in a sounding new chorus. chorus pedal, it, yeah, it's come a deep as sound- you are it- is the riff. I'm like, uh, test this chorus out. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, a lot of times I like chorus sounds that are almost really just a, like a flanger set as a chorus. And this yeah, is this good. is almost as deep as that. So, like that's the Andy Summers influence coming in again. Yes, I, can tell. I think so. Again, pretty sure. Uh, yes, yeah, amazing chorus sounds. That's right that's now, yeah. the, that's the pedal that I was excited about recently. Nice. Yeah, Terry. Terry knows an old one. I'm assuming. What's that? Uh, I think I, I got an old, old one, one and then I, I got a new one to see if it was just as good. And I I think it I think it sounded like pretty much the same. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I have it on my desk now. It's the old one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. It's really, really good. Yeah, I was about to say, um, Terry knows this about me, but I hoard things. Like, I have everything. Like, <laughs> I have my first guitar. Yeah, I just keep yeah. it. Like, I can't, uh, especially music gear, I just can't bear to part with anything. So um, I've only, I've only ever owned three boss pedals, and I still have them. <laughs> um, but the one that nice. I like the most out of them is the... Um, the bass synthesizer. I think this is like 96. Oh, that's why 3 Anyways, like as a guitar that's player, cool. I was always jealous of synth players. And so, you know, back in the 90s, I'm like, oh, I got to get it one of these. I'm going to be a synth player now. Not quite, but still really, really good. <laughs> and uh, the, um, the same sound, this um, Thundercat uses like the, this is also an envelope filter. So it does synth, but it also has like an envelope filter section. And, and that's what Thundercat uses for his bass. Oh, cool. Um, and then, uh, the second of the three is the, the boss harmonist. Like I was, you know, like, I think we talked about last time, just obsessed with rack gear, wanted an even tide, couldn't afford an even tide. I'm like, Oh, maybe this is an even tide in a pedal. This is, <laughs> this is their two voice, you know, diatonic pitch shifter. So there was that one, all nineties pedals. And then this one is kind of, um, a little bit of a sleeper, the tremolo pan. Um, that what's so oh, neat about it cool. is it does yes. tremolo. It does pan, but it also does this automated like mixing. So if you do two inputs and one output, you can do like an auto, like slow evolving blend between two sounds. So you can have like a two different guitar sounds and kind of blend them over time. It's really cool. <laughs> and it's it's I've it's a hidden that. feature. Man. <laughs> and something um we made a, a tremolo for um the tone core um series, and I put that same feature in there. But this did it first, and, and it's really cool. You, have two different inputs and then they blend over time. So stereo in mono out does some really cool stuff. That's awesome. See, look, dropping knowledge bombs. I've played one of those. Yeah, and I no have one no idea really that does. It, could do that, so. <laughs> it actually has it has four modes. It does <laughs> cool mono in mono out just does tremolo. Um, you can do mono in stereo out for the panning stuff. You can do um, stereo in mono out for the blending stuff I was talking about, and then. You do stereo in, stereo out. The panning does like a crossfade. It does, yeah, it's really kind of a smart little device. <laughs> I got to pick one up now. More things. Great. More things to buy. Ah. Well, those are normally where I would wrap up uh, for the main episode. I did remember, because Gina had posted that you guys were doing this on Instagram. The only question, there was a lot of people like, yay, so cool. But uh, the only question that had popped up before we started recording and apologies, I don't have the username in front of me, but I, I remember what it was. It was, do you guys have any like absolute favorite digital rack gear? Interesting. Digital rack gear, uh, the stuff that I had when I was a kid was all pretty much exclusively Digitech. Mm-hmm. And all that stuff was fun to use. I loved it. Um I didn't keep any of it. I'm kind of the opposite of Angela. I like churn through stuff. <laughs> I didn't keep any of it. I wish I would have kept it. Uh, there's an old Ibanez like shred machine I had in the 90s too that I kick myself for selling all the time. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, RG Those are cool. 750. Black on RG black. 770. Oh, 770. Sorry. 770. 770. No picture. I was thinking was, is, ah, was wrong. 
No pick guard. Angelo is jealous. He, see, he knows the difference. He knows that the seven, <laughs> like he's encyclopedic. <laughs> he's always been jealous of the uh, shark's tooth in, in lanes that I had. <laughs> yeah, those were pretty special. <laughs> I am too, to be perfectly honest. So, you know, but I, I got rid it. of it. I can't believe I did that. <laughs> I was there um, when you got rid of it too. I think like that oh, day, like you brought it in line six. You're like, oh, I'm saying goodbye to this guitar. Like, oh, why did I do that? <laughs> you couldn't talk him out of it. <laughs> no, he was like on something ledge, else. Like, I don't know if you were buying a Les Paul. Yeah, or what, I was in. I was in kind of like a. I think I was listening to a lot of Fugazi, and I was like, why do I need this? I got an SG instead. Um, yeah. Yeah. What fair. was the question, Blake? I totally derailed. Favorite. favorite oh, rack. favorite uh, digital rat gear. Oh, yeah. The Digitech the stuff asked. was kind of the only stuff that I had. I didn't have anything more expensive than that. I always wanted like an H3000 or something crazy like that, but um, I never got to even play through one In, until I got to, I Angelo. guess, Lane 6. Oh, there you go. Angelo, what digital rat gear is your favorite? And you probably still have it. Well, I, I didn't. So I, I, um, um, my, I had a, like a rack. I, I think I mentioned that last episode too, like, you know, saving up, I was washing dishes and I bought a GMP one and a Lexicon, uh, reverb, the Alex, cause it was the one I could afford, like the, um, the cheaper, cheaper Lexicon. But I always aspired, I mean, I, you know, all those records that were made with uh, H3000, there was always like this mythological thing. I mean, um, even, you know, um, there's that famous quote when they were doing the David Bowie albums, they're like, oh yeah, this thing messes with the fabric of time. So anyways, I always had to get one and I never, I never <laughs> had one, but um, uh, 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 we were, I, you know, I'm always like eyeing stuff and, and uh, we were taking, this was a couple years ago, we, we took a, like a family trip to Cambria up the coast and um, I noticed in Craigslist there was a guy selling an uh, H3000, uh, and I'm like, ah, oh, I gotta. Sorry, kids, I'm gonna leave you at the beach. I'm gonna go to this random guy's house <laughs> and pick up this H3000. And I got one, <laughs> and I'm so glad I did. Like, um, it's it's an amazing so digital cool. piece of gear, but it also the analog, um, which I think like Terry, that's Dave Durr who did the analog section. The analog section just okay. always sounds good. Like it just makes everything sound um, fatter and juicier. Um, it's a digital rack gear with an amazing um, analog input and output section. So yeah, it's definitely the H3000 for me. Nice. nice. Oh, I do have an Another answer for this that, that I didn't I think of this. On the list. Sorry. I, I, um, oh, what? Because I, I worked on a lot of rack gear as a tech, I mean, like a repair tech, even though I didn't own it. I always liked those Roland um, rack delays. I forget what they're called. And then the Korg main one was like very similar to like the um, the STD three thousand. Yeah. I forget what the Roland one is, but that yeah. one sounds cool too. Both of those rack delays I really like because they did like um, yeah. I forget about the STD three thousand. That's a nice yeah. yeah. They would have usually like a cool LFO that you could apply to the to the delay. Um, uh, what I'm trying to think of the um, the delay line. You know, basically you just modulate the delay line. Mm-hmm. Well, guys, this has been awesome. I always enjoy chatting with you, and uh, you know you're welcome back anytime. This was a good uh, a good chat, and uh, congrats on the release of this thing. And I can't wait to see what you guys do next. This is super cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, really. Thank appreciate you, Blake. It. We appreciate um, it. So so happy that you had us on. Well, for Terry and Angelo, this is Blake, and as always, folks, good luck and good tones. All right, there you have it, folks. Please make sure you check out LVX and all the other wonderful Maris goodies. The link to their website is in the show notes. And a big thank you to them for taking the time to come on. I really enjoyed chatting with them. And I really enjoy the Maris people. I want to shout out Gina. She's like the kind of unsung hero of Maris. Gina is the one who organized this and made it happen. She's fantastic. She's responsible for so much of the public-facing Maris stuff. She's brilliant, she's super cool, and she helped put all this together. So shout out, Gina. You're the best. Oh, and before I sign off, just a heads up. This week's bonus episode for the patrons of the show is a little bit different because normally I would record extra time with the guests. I had a snag come up where I had to jet out before we had time to finish that. We'll probably try to do it again at some point, but in the interest of time, I wanted this to come out sooner rather than later. And so 
This week, I have a bonus episode with my dude Charles from Silk Tone. He came by the Shred Shed. That was my very first in-person interview since lockdown, so that was pretty wild. But he's a great dude. We had a fun chat about his new fuzz pedal and some other stuff. That will be this week's bonus episode, and I hope you all enjoy that. And if you would like to support the show and you would like to get more juicy content, there are hundreds of episodes over there at this point, you can subscribe at patreon.com slash tone mob, where for five bucks a month, you will get extra episodes beamed right to your ears, and you truly help me out so incredibly much. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate y'all, and I will be talking to you on the internet very soon. Bye-bye. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com slash Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is ToneMob.com slash Stringjoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring, and he makes it simple, and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstreet as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out. Yes, we're out there, everyone. I'm Hal Schwartz. And I'm Flynn McClain. Together we host None But the Brave, a podcast dedicated to the music and career of Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and E Street Band are on tour right now for the first time in six years, and we're taking a detailed look at what's happening on stage in our bi-weekly episodes. We've also been recently joined by some very exciting guests, including rock journalist Warren Zanes and Stephen Hyden, Backstreet's Magazine founder Charles Cross, and Barstool's Kirk Menahan. If you're a diehard Springsteen fan, this is the show for you. So please subscribe to Nimbut the Brave on your favorite podcasting platform, and we hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much! We'll be seeing you! Hi, I'm Daniela Clark. I'm Barbara Ann Wild. And we are The Honest AF Show. Our podcast is real, honest conversation with our celebrity friends and pros. Covering our anything but average rock and roll lifestyles. All while tackling the hell that is aging and the battle of beauty. Oh yeah, nothing is off the table. The Honest AF Show is available wherever you get your podcasts.